Good day. As you all presumably know, I have been traveling around the English regions, and anybody who travels in the English regions in November, specifically during in the West Country, um, is going to take risks of catching virus infections. It's almost a certainty. And sure enough, I have in fact caught one. And um, today I've been feeling extremely unwell. Today I should say it's Friday, and this has delayed my making of this video, which will also inevitably, as a consequence, be rather short. I hope to be back in full production tomorrow. Um, I'm feeling slightly better this evening than I was earlier today, but anyway, we'll have to see. In the meantime, I think it's probably as well to do a quick summary of the news and of what's been going on and to provide my own brief commentaries about it. First of all, I think to everybody's astonishment, the Russians have already completed their withdrawal from Kherson region west of the Dnieper. I should say I'm going to use that expression west of the Dnieper rather a lot because actually, in territorial terms, 60% of Kherson region is located east of the Dnieper. The city of Kherson, of course, is on the west bank of the Dnieper. But anyway, the Russians completed it in extraordinary, uh, uh, at extraordinary speed. Apparently 30,000 troops were withdrawn from the area west of the Dnieper and uh, brought over to the East Bank, and interestingly enough, apparently at least some of them travelled across the Antonovsky Bridge, which strongly suggests that the damage that the Ukrainians were doing to the bridge may not have been quite as extensive or as irreparable as they themselves had believed. Anyway, um, I would just point out that General Milley, the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff apparently thought that the withdrawal would take several weeks. Well, it seems to have been carried out very efficiently over the space of three days. And the Russians say that they not only pulled back 30,000 of their troops across to the East Bank, but they've also retrieved all their functioning equipment and that they've withdrawn with 5,000 pieces of equipment. Now, the Ukrainians did try, apparently, to interfere with this withdrawal. There was missile and artillery strikes, but apparently the Russian air defences were able to intercept all the missiles, which seems extraordinary, but so they say. In some cases, the uh, missiles uh, were not shot down by Russian air defences, but very interestingly, the Russians say that their electronic jamming systems were successful in diverting some of these missiles. These must have been HIMARS missiles from their targets. Now, that begs lots of questions. It's the first time I've seen it uh, reported over the course of this conflict that uh, the Russians have actually jammed HIMARS missiles. But anyway, there it is. So... The Russians also say that their air, air force and their artillery was able to keep Ukrainian forces uh, um, around 30 kilometers, 30 to 40 kilometers away from the crossings so that the Ukrainians were not able to interfere with the crossings in any way. Now, this is by every measure a very orderly withdrawal. And it confirms that, I think, which every objective observer who has been following this conflict will have judged already, which is that this was obviously carried out according to a very carefully laid plan, one worked out over several weeks. If you remember, you recall that there was all sorts of reports coming in of the Russians creating fortif extra fortifications in Kherson region, a fact which was taken by many people, myself included, as an indication that they were planning to stay and fight. Well, I think those fortifications were clearly intended to provide scope for rear guard actions to keep the Ukrainians back, even as the Russians pulled out. So, a successful withdrawal from Kherson region. And I'm going to say something else, which is that 
The way in which this affair has been managed, the careful explanations provided by Ger General Surovikin of the decision, the way in which there's been for some time now preparations and hints that such a withdrawal would take place, and the orderly way in which the withdrawal itself was carried out, seemingly without significant losses, all of this has had the cumulative effect of keeping the mood in Russia calm. They are not, there's not that outburst of anger and recrimination that we saw after the Kharkov debacle. And I get to say something else. I mean, lots of people are referring to this as a Russian defeat. I'm not sure that I agree. On the one hand, they have, they have surrendered Kherson City, which is obviously psychologically and politically a major blow. And it's not clear to me that they will ever recapture it, though perhaps at some point they will. But anyway, they have withdrawn from Kherson City. But they've done this of their own volition. They made the decision to retreat and they pulled their forces across to the East Bank. One may consider this decision right or wrong, but it was a decision which the Russians themselves made. Up to now, every Ukrainian attempt to capture Kherson city by force, every blow struck by Ukraine over the course of its Kherson offensive has been successfully parried by the Russians. And Surovikin says, and this is his claim of course, we can't verify it, that 9,500 Ukrainian soldiers have died over the course of the fighting in Kherson region, and uh, which, um, and this does seem to be corroborated by um, information from the Ukrainian side. So, an orderly withdrawal, which, which was not made in any kind of state of crisis or emergency. And I would add that on the eve of the withdrawal announcement, there had been further Ukrainian attacks along the front lines, apparently instigated by Jake Sullivan over the course of his visit to Kiev last week. And all of them apparently had been, had either failed or had got bogged down. Most of them were thrown back. In one instance, at a place called Snigirevka, the Ukrainians apparently suffered extremely heavy losses. They were expecting to find resistance from the Russians at Snigirevka far weaker than it turned out to be. Uh, they did then mount a further attack. They did manage to capture um, the western part of the settlement, but there's no reason to think that this would have been any sort of breakthrough at Snigirevka, just as the Ukrainians achieved no breakthroughs anywhere else. So the pattern up to Wednesday of the Ukrainians launching attacks in penny packets against Russian forces in Kherson region were repeating themselves, and these attacks, again, were, as before, being thrown back. So the Russians were able to withdraw from Kherson region under their own steam, following the decisions made by their own commanders. And I'm going to come back to the reasons that Surovikin gave for the withdrawal, because yesterday, in my video yesterday, that's to say on Thursday, I said that one reason that Surovikin probably has at the back of his mind, but which he didn't mention, was the fact that um, the, uh, a large proportion of the forces that were defending Kherson region were paratroopers, Russia's airborne forces, the elite of Russia's infantry, and that Surovikin would probably have been frustrated that the bulk of the infantry, the, the, air, the paratroop infantry, were um, being used to defend Kherson city, whereas he would probably have wanted them somewhere else. And I said this was probably at the back of his mind. I hadn't actually at that point read fully all of Surovikin's comments. And in fact, I discovered that he did in fact 
make an allusion to this fact. He said that it made no sense to keep these troops in Kherson region. He didn't actually refer to the airborne troops specifically, but as I said, the bulk of the troops in Kherson region, in Kherson region on the West Bank, were paratroopers. He, he said that it made no sense to keep them in a single relatively small and contained part of the theater where they were not able to participate in any offensive actions. So there we go. Uh, a psychological blow for the Russians, no doubt, to have abandoned Kherson city, but one to which, as I've said, they've responded, the, the, the people in Russia have responded calmly. It has been as was said by Garland Nixon in a live stream that we did with him earlier today, a soft landing, which contrasts vividly with the events in Kharkiv um, a, few, uh, back, a few weeks ago, back in September. So, the Russians have pulled back to the east bank of the Dnieper, and they've destroyed the bridges after retreating. So they've destroyed the Antonovsky Bridge, and apparently they've taken steps to destroy the railway bridge across the Novaya Kakhovka Dam. I don't know how that was done, but apparently they've done it. So there is no real prospect, or so it seems, of the Ukrainians launching further attacks um, with infantry or armor across the Dnieper. They're not in any position to pull to advance across the Dnieper themselves. There's lots of speculation about the Ukrainians be, having brought themselves within range of the crossings from Kherson city from Kherson into Crimea and there's also uh, talk that the Ukrainians will be able to interfere with the operation of the Kherson canal I'm not convinced about the second but as to the first I can only say let's wait and see I'm not the expert to discuss this all with. Now, in the meantime, even whilst the Russians have been retreat, withdrawing from Kherson region, they have been advancing elsewhere. And yesterday, we got confirmation that Pavlovka, this village near Ugladar, Vugladar, the place which um, had been the topic of much recrimination and bitter anger and claims and counterclaims and accusations of heavy losses uh, that Pavlovka has now been fully captured by the Russian military. Pavlovska has been entirely brought under Russian control. And there's also been reports that the Russians have been making further advances around Donetsk, Donetsk city. And uh, there's reports that they captured a place called Opidnoye, which had been heavily fought over. And there's apparently another settlement that they've also captured. I should say these settlements are heavily fortified locations. The civilian population was removed from them um, years ago by the Ukrainian authorities. And they're essentially a string of he heavily fortified fortresses created by Ukraine around um, around Donetsk city. Well, it seems that these, the capture of these two places is bringing closer the point where the Russians will be able to complete the encirclement of um, Avdivka, which is the hub of Ukrainian operations in Donetsk. And there's also been reports that the uh, Ukrainians, sorry, sorry, that the Russians have been making further uh, advances in Bakhmut. And I would say that in his report to Shoigu, uh, Surovikin gave a rather cryptic reference to street fighting going on there. Now, having said all of this, one consequence of the Russian withdrawal from uh, Kherson is that just as the Russians are now in a position to redeploy their forces from Kherson, so are the Ukrainians. We don't quite know how many troops the Ukrainians had in this area, but it was several, several tens of thousands, apparently. And those troops can now also be redeployed to the Eastern Front, to Zaporozhye or Donbass. 
And maybe that is what the Ukrainians will do. And maybe that will make it more difficult for the Russians to continue their advance in Donbass. Though I would say that the vast bulk of the reservists that are being have been called up since the uh, mobilization order on the 21st of September, the bulk of these forces have not yet arrived at the battlefronts. And even though Russian positions have been getting stronger, um, the Russians have still not reinforced apparently to the level that they can consider uh, big offences. I have to say that I don't know how many troops Ukraine had in Kherson region. There's been speculation it was up to 60,000. Um, but obviously, if that's the case, well, 30,000 troops have been, Russian troops have been redeployed from Kherson region. Um, there's 300,000 coming. Some of them, of course, are already, uh, have joined up their units. Um, uh, but anyway, 300,000 reservists being called up altogether. And apparently there's an eight, another 80,000 volunteers from Russia also joining the fight. So I would have thought that whatever advantage Ukraine has achieved through this Ukra Russian withdrawal in terms of redeploying its own forces is going to be more than negated by the Russian redeployments. I'm going to say this. I think by far the biggest blow for the Russians from this affair is quite apart from the abandonment of a historic city, Kherson, founded by Prince Potomkin, Tavrichevsky, uh, one which the Russians now officially consider to be one of their own cities. I think the other big blow that comes from this is that it's clear that Surovikin, at least, has no interest at the present time in launching an advance towards Odessa. And I think that the major purpose of holding on to Kherson was always to provide a stepping stone to capture Odessa. I've often said that Odessa, uh, it would be very difficult for the Russians to end this war without capturing Odessa. There would be a massive feeling of letdown if that happened. Well, for the moment, it doesn't look as if capturing Odessa is part of the plan that Surovikin and the rest of the military have. So there we are. We've seen this withdrawal from Kherson region. We've seen these advances in Donbass. And of course, on Wednesday, um, Surovikin spoke about offensive operations and using the troops that he's redeployed from Kherson region to conduct offensive operations. We'll just have to wait and see what they are. And one thing he is continuing to do on a big scale is sustain this missile and drone offensive against Ukraine's energy infrastructure, which continues. Now, what is interesting about all of these events is that at one and the same time, as we've seen these events on the ground, we've seen words of caution coming from the Pentagon. General Milley is apparently going around saying to everybody that Ukraine has achieved or that it realistically can. The time has now come over the winter period for the Ukrainians to sit down and negotiate. And I get the sense that the Pentagon has never been fully enthusiastic about this Ukrainian commitment. But anyway, that is what General Milley is now reported as saying. And we have all of this swirl of rumours about various diplomatic initiatives underway that uh, Zelensky has apparently informed the Americans that he softened his position about no talks with the Russians until all Ukrainian territory, including Crimea, is returned to Ukraine. That's apparently what Zelensky is um, reported as saying. Um, I see no evidence of this. Um, but anyway, there's talk that some kind of moves towards negotiations are coming. And interestingly enough, the initiative for all of this is coming from the United States. Now, Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, has issued a statement. He said that the Russians have no 
information about any diplomatic initiatives. Certainly they've seen nothing coming from Kiev that suggests that the Ukrainians are interested in sitting down and talking. He also said that Kherson remains a Russian city, implying that at some point the Russians intend to take it back. And so far as I could see, he said that everything, the entire um, operation, the special operation in Ukraine, continues much as before, but with the emphasis now on Zaporozhye and Donbass. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see where this goes, whether there is, in fact, any kind of diplomatic initiative. My own personal view about it is this. I think that the Ukrainians and their hardline American sponsors and their, and their British sponsors will almost certainly sabotage any negotiations that are floated at this time, even if these get off the ground at all, which I strongly doubt. I think that they will take the recapture of Herson as encouragement to harden their positions, not to soften them. I think the Russians know that perfectly well, and I think that the Russians are going to concentrate from this point onward on the military operations in Donbass and on the economic problems that they're inflicting on the West, which are mounting. Now, on that, on that front, we've now received some reports that the Dutch government has finally allowed uh, fertilizer, uh, Russian fertilizer, which has been holed up in Dutch ports, presumably Rotterdam, to finally leave the country. All of which suggests, by the way, that uh, Putin's agreement to re-enter the grain deal with Erdogan was a rather more complicated affair than we actually know, and that Erdogan probably negotiated some deals on Putin's behalf with the Europeans in order to get this Russian food and fertilizer, which is tied up in uh, European ports, to start to get that released. Well, we shall see. And in the meantime, there's also finally evidence that China is starting ever so gradually to ease up its various uh, lockdown restrictions. And on the strength of that, we're now starting to see increases in oil prices, global oil prices. And I suspect that trend is going to continue. And we will see, no doubt, over the next few weeks and months, um, increases, I suspect, in both oil and gas prices as the cold weather deepens in Europe, as it is widely expected to do. Lastly, I'm going to just reference this topic of the midterms. Now, I'm not going to speak much about the midterms in the United States. We're doing it on the Durand a program with Robert Barnes in which we will be dissecting the results of the midterms uh, to find out what exactly did actually happen over the course of the midterms. But what I'm going to say is this. In the run-up to the midterms, um, there'd been a whole series of statements from Russian officials, including Peskov, about the midterms in which they said very straightforwardly that they expected that the midterms, the result of the midterms, would change nothing with respect to US foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine or any other matter. Even if the Republicans had won a landslide in the, in the House of Representatives, which they didn't do, and even if they'd won the Senate, which they might still do, but it's, as of this moment, something of a toss-up, even if the Republicans had gained control of Congress, the Russians didn't believe that this would change anything at all. They believe, and they may very well be right, that in spite of the fact that some members of the populist wing of the Republican Party have come out in opposition to funding for Ukraine, the Russians believe that there is still a strong bipartisan consensus in Washington to support for support for aid to Ukraine. So I don't think the Russians, uh, who have been following the midterms, are particularly bothered or concerned about the outcome. So, overall, 
an interesting week, the one we've just seen. As a, uh, a Russian withdrawal from Kherson region, uh, midterm elections, which as I said, we're going to analyze in more detail eventually. I'm going to venture my own opinion, which is that I think that these events, though striking, are perhaps over the long term none too important. It's clear to me that over the last couple of weeks, the Russians have been digging in for a long war. They pointed Surovikin, overall commander. They carried out this major mobilization. As I've discussed in previous programs, Putin has been taking steps to mobilize the Russian economy, to support the military in the conflict. He created, he's created this coordinating council, which though it's nominally chaired by the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Mishutsin, is, as is now clear, essentially led by Putin himself. All of these point to a long war. And from a Russian point of view, given that they are working towards some kind of long war, it's likely that the withdrawal from Kherson somehow fits into that as well. So I don't think that the withdrawal from Kherson is perhaps quite as consequential as it might have appeared a few weeks or months ago. And as for the midterms, I think also the same thing. I think even if the Republicans had won a landslide, it would have caused severe problems for the Biden administration. It would have made the Biden administration, it would have distracted the Biden administration from certain aspects of its foreign policy, but it would probably not materially reduce US support for Ukraine. I still believe, by the way, that we're going to see a political crisis in the United States next year. I think if the Republicans do gain control of the House of Representatives, which for the moment still seems likely, I think that they will leverage that in order to try to extract um, damage uh, against Biden, though, though I doubt now that impeachment is a realistic possibility. But no doubt the Republicans will launch their own investigations, they'll invo launch investigations into a certain laptop and its former owner, they'll probably launch investigations into various other matters, and we will see, of course, how this thing plays out over the next few months. But I would have thought that without control of Congress, opinion in the United States, politics in the United States is going to start inevitably turning inwards. And I also think that the world, big as it is, all sorts of other problems will start to float up to the surface. And we will probably see over the course of next year, other crises in other places, making, as I said, Ukraine 2022's news. Now, there's one last thing I want to discuss, and that is Putin's decision not to attend the G20 summit. He sent his foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, in his place. Now, there's been much discussion about why Putin did this. It's been suggested that he didn't go, he decided not to go, because... Um, he was uh, concerned about the optics in case the Western leaders turned their backs on him. I don't think he gives a sausage about that, to be straightforward about this, not at this stage. I think the reason Putin decided not to go was because I think his security advisors have probably told him that going was risky. <laughs> um, he would be leaving the Eurasian zone where his movements are relatively secure. He could find himself in a place like Bali, where his plane could be intercepted on its way back, perhaps. And anyway, I think that there were probably concerns in Moscow. In fact, I don't think that I, I've seen commentaries to that effect in the Russian media. There were concerns that if he did go to Bali, there was no guarantee that he'd able to return to Russia. And I think that's the reason he didn't go. And I think it's an important fact to bear in mind, because it also shows the total collapse that there is at the moment 
in trust between all the great powers. Now, I'm not going to discuss whether these Russian concerns for Putin had any merit to them. It would have been a pretty extraordinary thing if his plane had been in intercepted and he'd been, say, taken somewhere and, well, who knows what. But so many extraordinary things have happened over the last year. I mean, I never imagined that there would be sanctions against the Russian central bank and that Russia's international reserves held in Western banks would be frozen. I would have thought that was inconceivable. After all, the United States and the West and Russia are not at war. So I'm not even sure, as I've said previously, what the legal basis of doing that is. In fact, I'm pretty sure that there is no legal basis. But regardless of that, if they're prepared to do something like that, well, I'm not convinced that they might not do even more radical things, even if arresting Putin, if that's what the Russians were afraid of, does seem something of a stretch. But anyway, that, in my, re in my opinion, is the reason why Putin didn't go to Bali. He clearly did want to go. But I get the impression, the strong impression, that he was talked out of it by his security people. Anyway, that's me for the day. As you can tell, my voice is far from clear. But um, hopefully by tomorrow, I'll be more like myself again. Thank you for joining me again today. Remember, you can find us on our various other platforms, Locals, our main alternative platform, Rumble, um, BitChute, Odyssey, um, and, of course, uh, Rockfin, and Telegram. I should not forget to mention Telegram. And, of course, if you want to support our work, you can do so um, via uh, Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. And last but not least, you can go to our, you should think about going to our shop, buy the amazing things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all the rest. And also, if you've liked this video, please don't forget to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon.